Welcome to Train Engineers Newsletter Live program. I'm Jeannie Harshaw, and today we'll discuss trends in small rooftop systems. Now we often get requests for abbreviated takeaways from our most popular programs. So in 2015, we produced an ENL on trends in chilled water systems, which combined some new information with highlights from other recent ENL programs. It was so well received that we're going to try it again today on small rooftop systems. Today's program is a blend of some new topics and new ways to consider some old topics. On today's program, we'll discuss several recent trends in small rooftop systems. We'll start with efficiency regulations, then talk about variable speed technology applied to both compressors and fans. We'll touch on modulating heat and finish with controls. And throughout, we'll be highlighting recent changes to ASHRAE Standard 90.1 and how they impact small rooftop systems. Today, we have train application engineers John Murphy and Eric Sturm to walk us through this discussion. John will get us started off. The package rooftop unit is arguably the workhorse of the HVAC industry. It's a factory assembled product that typically contains a plenum for mixing outdoor air with recirculated air, a filter, cooling coil, possibly a gas fired burner or electric heater, a supply fan, controls, and all the components of a direct expansion refrigeration system. Most use an air cooled condenser like the example shown here, but sometimes a water cooled or evaporative cooled condenser is used instead. Now, as its name implies, this type of equipment is typically installed outdoors on the roof of the building. A building might use a single rooftop unit or several units depending on its size, load characteristics, and function. Package rooftop equipment is available from very small sizes up to several hundred tons of cooling capacity. For this program, we're just going to focus on small rooftop systems, which we're defining as 3 to 25 tons of cooling capacity. Now, one reason why this type of equipment has been so popular is due to its packaged nature. Most of the components of the system are packaged inside the rooftop unit and assembled in a factory. This makes design and installation relatively simple and usually keeps the cost low. In addition, the controls are typically pre-engineered and factory installed, so commissioning and startup are faster than for other types of systems. Since the equipment is typically installed on the roof, the amount of usable floor space inside the building is maximized. And maintenance is done outside of the occupied spaces. Often the only part of the system located inside the occupied space is a temperature sensor mounted on the wall. And this packaged nature, combined with being located outside, usually makes this type of equipment easier to replace in smaller buildings. Of course, some of these characteristics might also be drawbacks. For example, to keep costs low when packaging all the components, the range of available options may be limited, resulting in less flexibility than some other types of systems where the components are separate. And while locating the equipment outside frees up space inside the building, this can also pose challenges. It requires proper structural support and it can impact the aesthetics of the building. Also, outdoor equipment may be more challenging to maintain, particularly in harsh climates. And finally, space is required for ductwork inside the building to transport the cooled or heated air to the occupied spaces. As I mentioned, on today's program, we're going to discuss several recent trends related to these small rooftop systems. The first trend is related to efficiency regulations. Minimum efficiency requirements for small rooftop equipment can come from several sources, from national or regional regulators down to even local regulations in some cases. John? Probably the most familiar to this audience are ASHRAE Standard 90.1 or the International Energy Conservation Code. Standard 90.1 includes tables of minimum efficiency requirements for a wide range of HVAC equipment. These tables are then adopted by the IECC in its following code cycle. For example, the tables from the 2010 version of Standard 90.1 are adopted into the 2012 version of the IECC, while the tables from the 2013 version of 90.1 
are adopted into the 2015 IECC. But the U.S. Department of Energy also plays a role. For small rooftop equipment, the DOE has historically mandated minimum efficiencies through the use of federal regulation. Here's an example. Back in 2004, version 90.1, the minimum required cooling efficiency of a 5-ton packaged air-cooled rooftop unit was increased from 9.7 to 12.0 SEER, effective January 2006. Now these increases in minimum efficiency requirements are typically handled by the standard 90.1 committee, working in conjunction with the AHRI committee that corresponds to each product category. But in this case, the Department of Energy announced in April 2004 that it was requiring the minimum efficiency to be increased even further from 12 to 13 SEER. So the 90.1 committee issued an addendum to make the standard consistent with that federal regulation. And now, just recently, the DOE regulated that this minimum efficiency be increased from 13 to 14 SEER, effective January of 2017. This change was included in the recently published 2016 version of ASHRAE 90.1. Now, while most jurisdictions are not required to comply with the 2016 version yet, the federal regulation supersedes. That is, all packaged air-cooled rooftop units, five tons and smaller, must meet this 14 SEER requirement, regardless of which version of Standard 90.1 or the IECC applies to your jurisdiction. Now, in addition to more stringent minimum efficiency requirements, another trend has been to move from full load efficiency to a more blended or seasonalized efficiency metric. EER is the ratio of cooling output at AHRI standard rating conditions divided by the power consumed at those same conditions. This provides a full load efficiency metric. SEER, or the seasonal energy efficiency ratio, is a ratio of a season's worth of cooling produced divided by the same season's worth of energy used. It's sort of a blended efficiency metric that attempts to encompass both full load and part load operation. And finally, IEER, or the integrated energy efficiency ratio, is another blended efficiency metric. It's a time weighted efficiency calculation at four load conditions, 100, 75, 50, and 25 percent. So for packaged air cool rooftop units that are five tons and smaller, SEER has been the metric used for minimum cooling efficiency for many years now. But IEER first appeared in the 2010 version of Standard 90.1. Since that time, the minimum required efficiency for air-cooled rooftops larger than 5 tons has been based on both full load EER and this IEER metric. For example, a 15-ton unit with gas heat must have a full load efficiency of at least 10.8 EER and an IEER of at least 11. Both efficiency levels must be met for the equipment to comply with the standard. Now one more piece of news on the regulation front. As I mentioned, the DOE regulates rooftop units five tons and smaller using the blended SEER efficiency metric. Now, effective January 2018, its regulation for units larger than five tons will switch from a full load EER requirement and instead use just the IEER efficiency metric. The minimum IEER values for this class of equipment will be the same as what's currently listed in the 2013 version of Standard 90.1. As a summary, this chart depicts the changing efficiency requirements in Standard 90.1 for small air-cooled rooftop units. You can see how the minimum efficiency requirements for this class of equipment have increased over recent years. And while minimum IEER requirements were added in the 2010 version, you can also see that they've increased in more recent versions of the standard. Now there's a large number of small rooftop units installed every year, which is one reason why the DOE focuses on this class of equipment. Regulating higher efficiency levels can have a significant impact due to the number of units and buildings affected. Also, unlike some other classes of equipment, the vast majority of small rooftop units 
purchased are at the minimum required efficiency level. So regulating higher minimum efficiency levels has a significant impact. Thanks, John. Let's move on to our next trend. Eric will walk us through what's recently changed in rooftop refrigeration systems. When it comes to rooftop refrigeration, the heart of the entire system is the scroll compressor. Let's quickly review how it works. This type of compressor features two sim similar spiral halves called scrolls that mesh within one another. The upper or stationary scroll is fixed. There's a discharge port in the center of it. The lower scroll is driven by a motor and orbits within the stationary. While orbiting, a pocket is created for refrigerant gas to be drawn in. A thin layer of oil provides a seal to prevent compressed refrigerant from escaping. It might be helpful to see an animation of this. Here, you can see a cutaway of the whole unit, but with the top of the stationary scroll removed. Refrigerant vapor, first used to cool the electric motor, is drawn into a pocket through the suction on the right side, shown as blue gas. As the driven scroll rotates, the pocket volume decreases and the refrigerant is compressed. When the pocket reaches the center, the compressed gas is released through the discharge port to the condenser. Now, of course, coil load varies throughout system operation. The compressor must match the load, so some sort of unloading strategy is needed. Manufacturers can alter compressor operation with on-off control, hot gas bypass, or variable speed motor control. Manufacturers can also alter the traditional scroll compressor design by using a digital compressor or pocket unloading. Of the options available, variable speed does quite well when it comes to energy efficiency and part load operation. One trend has been to pair permanent magnet motors and variable speed drives with scroll compressors. These motors are brushless, which reduces friction and the current losses in the rotor are smaller when compared to induction motors. Introducing a variable speed drive can add 2 to 4% of loss at full load. Now here's a chart that shows efficiency as a percentage along the vertical axis and frequency on the horizontal axis. First, the variable speed permanent magnet motor efficiency is shown from 30 to 90 hertz as the green curve. Finally, the variable speed induction motor efficiency or the same operational range is shown as the blue curve. At lower frequencies, the efficiency of the induction motor drops more than the permanent magnet motor. And here's a chart that compares energy consumption of a fixed speed and variable speed compressor at four operating points, all consistent with IEER. Both compressors are of the same cooling capacity, six tons. Remember that IEER is a weighted average at four loading points, 100%, 75%, 50%, and 25% of design cooling capacity. Also, the latter three operational points include some ambient relief. The delta between the design condenser temperature, say 95 degrees, and the test condition. So here are the first two operating points at 100% load and design condenser conditions. The green point is the variable speed compressor and the blue is the fixed speed. Notice that at full load, the variable speed compressor actually draws a little more power than the fixed speed compressor. This is attributed to those losses at the variable speed drive. As the load and ambient conditions decrease, the variable speed compressor starts to show benefit. And that trend continues as the load and ambient temperatures decrease further. Now looking at these operating points, it seems like the difference between them is slight, but that's not really the case. For example, at 50% load, the fixed speed compressor uses a time-weighted 1,425 watts versus 973 for the fixed speed. That's nearly a 32% reduction in power at the same load and ambient conditions. Now this was a straightforward example of two similar scroll compressors and not necessarily indicative 
of all compressors. Some rooftops use a single compressor, while others might use multiple. Here's a system operation example where both a fixed speed and variable speed compressor are paired together. The compressor on the left is a variable speed unit, while the one on the right is a fixed speed. When there's a call for cooling, the unit controller will start the variable speed compressor and control it to maintain discharge air temperature. The variable speed compressor capacity is increased to match the load until it reaches the capacity of the fixed speed compressor. At this point, the unit controller starts the fixed speed compressor, then the variable speed compressor is reduced to its minimum speed to prevent overcooling the supply air. As the cooling load increases, the unit controller will modulate the variable speed compressor to maintain the discharge air temperature. The compressors are staged down in the reverse order. There are some other benefits to using variable speed compressors, including precise discharge air temperature control, being able to operate down to 15 to 25 percent of full speed, and the ability to better retain refrigerant gas in the compression pocket at lower speeds. But these advantages do come with several drawbacks, including the fact that compressor control is more complicated and they're typically more expensive. Another trend has been the recent usage of microchannel coils. These use tiny channels as opposed to the traditional fin tube coil. Oftentimes, these are used as condenser coils. When compared against the fin tube coil, microchannel coils are generally lighter and they hold less refrigerant, which reduces the total system charge and that can increase reliability. They're also made out of a single material, aluminum, versus fin tube coils, which might be made out of several aluminum and copper. Finally, there are fewer brazing points, which reduces the potential for refrigerant leaks. There are some drawbacks to microchannel coils, though. Once installed, they're susceptible to damage through negligence and weather, like hail. Because of their design and construction, they're difficult to repair. When a coil is damaged, it often needs to be replaced. And in some applications, microchannel coils are being used on the evaporator side as well. Thanks, Eric. Next, John will take us through trends in the heating side of the rooftop unit. John? Historically, most small rooftop units include some source of heat also, but that depends on climate. The largest percentage of units are equipped with a gas fire burner using natural gas. But in locations where gas service is not available or the need for heat is expected to be minimal, electric resistance heat is pretty popular. And some units are configured as being an air source or water source heat pump, reversing the refrigeration circuit to provide heat when needed. And then occasionally a hot water heating coil might be used if the building has a boiler installed, but this is rare. Now regarding recent trends, the first is toward the use of modulating heat. Historically, most small rooftops have used fairly expensive staged gas fire burners, but more recently, there's been an increased demand for modulating burners. Much of the benefit from modulating heat is found in systems with variable speed fan control, so we'll talk more about this in the next section. The second trend has been a greater demand for heat pump models. This has been driven by buildings that include technology to generate electricity on site. For example, if the building has PV solar panels and they generate sufficient electricity during the heating season, a heat pump provides a way to use that electricity for heating. Well, since you said that modulating heat and variable speed fan control are closely related, let's move right into that section to discuss those benefits. Historically, small rooftop units have primarily been used in single zone systems. That is, one rooftop unit serves a single thermal zone and is controlled by a single thermostat located in the occupied space. So a building would typically have multiple rooftop units, one for each zone. Now most of the time, the supply fan uh, is operating at a constant speed, delivering a constant CFM to the zone. The thermostat then varied cooling or heating capacity in response to the changing load. But more recently, small rooftop units have been equipped with variable speed drives to vary this airflow and save energy. This is often referred to as single zone VAV system. 
In this case, the temperature sensor in the zone is used to also vary the fan speed in addition to cooling or heating capacity. Now this requires more thoughtful control. The rooftop unit controller compares the current zone temperature to the desired set point and then makes decisions regarding how much air to supply to the zone and at what temperature. Now this chart depicts an example of single zone VAV control. The x-axis is a sensible load in the zone with a design heating load on the far left and design cooling load on the far right. When the zone is at the design cooling load, the fan is operating at full speed, delivering maximum supply airflow at the design supplier temperature for cooling, say 55 degrees for example. As the zone cooling load decreases, the fan speed is slowed down to reduce supply airflow. Cooling capacity is then staged or modulated to maintain the supplier temperature at the same cold set point. Now eventually, the zone cooling load decreases to the point where the fan supply fan has reached its minimum span, fan speed. At this point, the fan continues to operate at minimum speed, but now the supplier temperature has to be gradually reset upward to avoid overcooling the zone. Eventually, the load decreases to the point where the zone temperature drops below the cooling set point into the dead band between the cooling and heating set points. In this dead band, the fan continues to operate at minimum speed with no compressors or heaters operating. Now let's consider what happens when the zone eventually requires heating, that is, when the zone temperature drops to its heating set point. The fan continues to operate at minimum speed, and the supplier temperature set point is now reset upward further so it's warmer than the zone. Heating capacity is modulated to maintain the supplier temperature at this set point. Now eventually the zone heating load may increase to the point where the supplier temperature reaches a preset maximum limit, say 90 degrees for example. At this point, the supply fan speeds back up again, increasing airflow while heating capacity is modulated to maintain the supplier temperature at this maximum limit. Now let me revisit this portion of the control sequence again since it's often a source of confusion. Here the zone still needs cooling but the load is low enough that the fan has turned down to its minimum speed. Even at this minimum airflow, 55 degree air may provide too much cooling, causing the zone to overcool. So the supply air temperature set point needs to be reset upward. Now if the space latent load and outdoor humidity level are both high at times when the space sensible cooling load is so low that the fan has turned down all the way to its minimum speed, the space humidity level could rise as a result of this warmer, wetter supply air. But how likely is this combination of low space sensible load, high space latent load, while it's still warm and humid outside? From what I've seen, the biggest culprit is oversized equipment. If the unit is significantly oversized, the fan may never run up in this range. While the unit was selected for this load, its actual maximum load might actually be down somewhere in here. So it doesn't take much reduction for the fan to reach its minimum speed and the supplier temperature set point to start needing to be reset upward. So oversizing is bad when it comes to humidity, even if you have variable speed fan control. The other culprit is a zone with extreme variable occupancy. An example might be an auditorium, where the design load is based on a person sitting in every seat. But normally, that zone only has a few occupants. In this case, the unit may not technically be oversized for those few times with full occupancy, but performs like it's oversized for the vast majority of operating hours. For this application, some single zone VAV rooftop units can be equipped with hot gas reheat also. In this case, variable speed fan control can do a good enough job of limiting indoor humidity levels most of the time, but the reheat can kick in, kick in if it's ever needed. Now previously I talked about modulating versus staged heat in small rooftop equipment. So let's bring on Eric to talk about how this impacts fan speed control. The control sequence that John just showed varied the fan speed in both cooling and heating modes. This is possible if modulating heat is used in the rooftop. 
Examples include a modulating gas burner, a modulating electric heater, like SCR, or a hot water coil with a modulating valve. But if staged heat is used in the rooftop, it may not be able to vary airflow when the heater is on. Examples include a staged gas burner, a staged electric heater, or a heat pump when it's operating in the heating mode. In this case, the control sequence will vary airflow and cooling, like we just explained, but then increase the fan to full speed whenever the heater is activated. That is, if the zone temperature drops below its heating set point, the heater is cycled on to warm the zone with the fan operating at full speed. Once the zone temperature is raised back up into the dead band, the heater cycles off and the fan again backs down to its minimum speed. With this recent trend toward variable speed fan control on small rooftops, the primary benefit is fan energy savings. To demonstrate, here's an example of performance curve for a fan in a 25 ton rooftop unit. The x-axis is airflow and the y-axis is static pressure. This chart also shows the fan speed and brake horsepower. For this example, the fan is selected to deliver 9,000 CFM at 3 inches of static pressure. The fan must rotate at 1120 RPM to achieve these conditions and requires 8.4 brake horsepower. Now in this unit, the minimum allowable fan speed is 50%, which equates to 560 RPM for this example. Now in a single zone VAV system, there are no zone level dampers that open and close since there's just one zone. So when this fan slows down, it unloads along a constant system curve like this. And so at 50% speed, the fan delivers 50% airflow. That is, in this case, the system follows the fan laws. And the fan brake horsepower is reduced by the cube of the airflow reduction down to 1.1 horsepower. So in a single zone VAV system, a 50% reduction in airflow results in an 87% reduction in fan power. Now due to this energy saving potential, requirements for variable speed fan control in single zone systems were first added to ASHRAE 90.1 in its 2010 version. Here's the wording from that section. I'm just showing part B, which addresses systems that use direct expansion cooling like package rooftops. Section A, which is not shown, applies to systems that use chilled water. For DX equipment, variable airflow control is required when the rated cooling capacity of the unit is 110,000 BTUs per hour or larger. This equates to just over 9 tons. Now note that in an effort to make this simpler to enforce, this threshold is based on capacity at the HRI standard rating conditions not actual capacity in a given application. The supply fan controls must be able to reduce airflow to at least two-thirds of full fan speed, or down to the volume of outdoor air required to meet ASHRAE 62.1, if that's larger than the threshold. Now, beginning in the 2013 version of Standard 90.1, the threshold at which variable airflow control is required was lowered even further. For equipment with DX cooling, the more recent versions now require variable airflow control whenever rated cooling capacity is 65,000 BTUs per hour or larger. This affects rooftop equipment that is larger than 5.4 tons. Now next, another trend is that small rooftops are being used more and more often in multiple zone VAV systems. In this case, one rooftop unit serves more than one zone. Each controls by its own temperature sensor and VAV terminal unit. Now, while these rooftop multiple zone VAV systems have been around for decades, they've typically used larger equipment. Now, even some of the smallest rooftop units are being applied in this type of system. As these zone dampers modulate, open and close, the pressure in the supply ductwork changes. So a pressure sensor is mounted in the duct and used to vary the speed of the supply fan. Now earlier I showed how in a single zone VAV system the fan unloads along a constant system curve 
so it follows the fan laws. But in a multiple zone VAV system, there are these zone level dampers that modulate at part load. This adds restriction or pressure drop to the system when the fan is delivering less airflow. So in this case, the fan does not unload along a constant system curve. Rather, it unloads along a curve between the design operating point and the duct stack pressure set point, which is set at one inch in this example. So in a multiple zone VAV system, the fan does not follow the fan laws, since the system is constantly changing as these zone dampers modulate. Now the reason I show you this is to demonstrate the relationship of fan speed to airflow in this type of system. In this example, the minimum allowable fan speed is 50%, which equates to 560 RPM. But in a multiple zone VAV system, 50% minimum speed does not mean that the fan cannot deliver any less than 50% airflow. In fact, in this example, the fan doesn't even reach its minimum speed. Now, on previous ENL programs, we've talked several times about optimizing this static pressure control function to reduce fan energy use even further. When the VAV boxes are equipped with communicating controllers, each box knows the current position of its damper. The building automation system continually pulls the VAV box controllers, looking for the zone with the most open damper, and then resets this duct static pressure set point lower and lower until the worst case VAV damper is nearly wide open. The airflow delivered by the fan remains the same, but it only needs to generate enough pressure to push the required quantity of air through that worst case VAV box. So the VAV dampers will be able to operate further open with less pressure drop. The result is that at part load conditions, the supply fan operates at a lower static pressure than it would with a fixed one inch pressure set point. This lowers fan horsepower and saves energy. It'll also make it more likely that the fan will reach its minimum speed, which again is 560 RPM. But in a multiple zone VAV system, the zone level dampers will continue to close at lower and lower loads. And even if the fan has reached its minimum speed, it will simply ride the fan curve to deliver less airflow if needed. This optimized control of fan pressure in a multiple zone VAV system has been required by ASHRAE 90.1 since 1999 and applies to any system that exceeds five horsepower. This requirement has remained essentially unchanged except for the highlighted section at the bottom, which was added in the 2013 version. Now sometimes a VAV box may have been undersized or the flex duct downstream has been pinched so it doesn't allow for the required airflow. Maybe the zone temperature set point has been reset way too low, or the zone sensor was installed right above the coffee maker. Uh, any of these problems would cause the VAV damper serving that zone to drive further open than would typically be necessary. And this will limit the amount of fan energy that can be saved using this control strategy. So in the 2013 version, ASHRAE 90.1 add the requirement that the controls need to automatically detect those zones that may be culprits of not allowing the duct pressure to be reset downward. It also requires that the operator be allowed to remove those zones from the reset algorithm in an effort to achieve the desired fan energy savings. Now let's return to the modulating versus stage heat discussion again and bring back Eric to discuss how this affects a multiple zone VAV system. In a multiple zone VEV system, terminal boxes may include a reheat coil to warm the supply air for the specific zone served. In this example, there are two zones served by VEV boxes with reheat coils. Some multiple zone rooftops are equipped with a heater. Now I'm going to use some analog gauges to help demonstrate system operation throughout the next few examples. The first gauge is supply airflow, and the second is discharge air temperature at the rooftop. If modulating heat is used, the rooftop's discharge air temperature can be controlled. Modulating the heat source on VAV rooftops also permits a greater range of airflow. When the rooftop unit is equipped with modulating heat, its operation is similar in both cooling and heating modes. When the supply airflow needs to be cooled, 
the compressors are cycled or modulated to maintain the discharge air temperature at the desired set point, say 55 degrees. Supply air temperature reset can be used to increase the discharge air temperature set point. For example, the supplier temperature might be raised from 55 to 60 or 65 degrees. This can reduce the amount of cooling done at the rooftop and reduce the amount of reheat used in each VEB box. The supply fan speed is modulated to maintain the duct static pressure at set point. So let's see how modulating heat can work in a rooftop. As the loads decrease, the supply fan slows to its minimum. When it's cold outside and the resulting mixed air temperature drops below the discharge air temperature set point, the heater inside the rooftop is activated and modulated to maintain the discharge air temperature at set point, like 60 degrees. The fan continues to maintain duct pressure at set point. If local heat is needed, the reheat coils are turned on and the supplier temperature to the zone is increased even further. But if the rooftop unit is equipped with staged heat, not modulating, it cannot vary airflow when the heater is on. So, if the mixed air temperature drops below the discharge air temperature set point, the system simply relies on the heat in the zone level VEB terminals to warm the zone. If there are zone VEB terminals that do not have heat, or if some of the zones don't have sufficient heating capacity for the current conditions, this will likely cause the temperature in these zones to drop below their heating set points. When this happens, the system can enter a daytime warm-up mode. The VEB dampers are all commanded to wide open. The supply fan ramps up to full speed and the staged heater cycles on to deliver warm air down the ductwork. This raises the temperature in all zones. When the cold zones have warmed back up, the system returns to normal operation. The rooftop unit heater cycles off, the fan slows back down to maintain duct pressure at set point, and the VV boxes are allowed to modulate closed once again. Now if staged heat is used, the supply fan will be sped up to the design heating airflow and held constant. The system fan is controlled to provide a constant supply of heated air. The discharge air temperature is not controlled. This is one reason why the airflow must be constant. And this is very similar to what we just saw with single zone VEV. Now there is a variation of this called changeover VEV. This is not the same as changeover bypass. In this configuration, there are few or no reheat coils and the modulating heat in the rooftop is used to provide warm supply air. Using a voting system, the rooftop controller switches from cooling to heating. This is the changeover. The system still operates like a traditional VEB system. The discharge air temperature is controlled to a specific set point, say 90 degrees. The VEV dampers limit flow to zones to prevent overheating, and the supply fan is modulated to maintain the duct static pressure set point. This system should use modulating heat. If a staged heater is installed, constant airflow is needed. The VEV damper is still closed to limit supply airflow and the fan will ride up its fan curve. As a result, the supply airflow will decrease and the unit may trip on low airflow across the heater. The last set of trends we'll discuss today are related to controls. Some of these are related to increased use of certain control strategies while others are related to new technology being applied to these small rooftop systems. The first control strategy, airside economizing, has long been used in packaged rooftop equipment. It's a damper arrangement that allows the system to supply up to 100% outdoor air to reduce or eliminate the need for mechanical cooling energy during mild or cold weather. While this is certainly not a new concept, there have been some recent changes in energy codes as well as benefits from new technology. Requirements for economizers were significantly expanded starting in the 2010 version of ASHRAE 90.1. As you can see here in red, 
Nearly all climate zones in the continental U.S. require an economizer when the system's design cooling capacity is greater than 54,000 BTUs per hour, which equates to four and a half tons. Only in the very southern tip of Florida, climate zone 1A, are economizers not required. John, I think it's useful to point out that in the 2016 version of standard 90.1, the climate zones are now defined by reference to ASHRAE standard 169. And the climate zone categories have been updated using the latest weather data. So if you need to comply with 90.1 2016, be sure to check the climate zone for your county. It may have changed from previous versions. That's right. And as an example, Palm Beach County in South Florida has historically been climate zone 2A. But in the 2016 version, it's being reclassified to climate zone 1A. So in this case, it will not require an economizer. Now, in addition to being required in more climates and on smaller systems, improvements in control technology have led to new requirements for automatic fault detection of airside economizers. These requirements, which were added in the 2015 version of the IECC and then in the 2016 version of ASHRAE 90.1, define which faults must be automatically detected. For example, if the current outdoor conditions suggest that the economizer should be enabled, but the damper has not been opened beyond its minimum setting, that's considered a fault. If a fault is detected, the controller must be capable of reporting it to the operating and servicing personnel. Now we produced an ENL program last year where we demonstrated this automatic fault detection and also discussed the standard 90.1 changes in much more detail. It's listed in your bibliography if you want to dig into that further. Now the next control strategy is demand control ventilation. This strategy attempts to reduce the amount of outdoor air being brought into the zone during periods of partial occupancy. This reduces the cooling and heating energy required to get addition to that outdoor air. Now historically, most people think of CO2 sensors being used for this control. But, but depending on the space, an occupancy sensor, some type of people counting technology, or a time of day schedule might be more appropriate for implementing this strategy. While this is not a new concept either, a recent trend has been the increased use of this control strategy due to changes in energy codes. ASHRAE 90.1 has long required DCV in densely occupied spaces, but prior to the 2007 version, it only affected a few types of spaces. Those where the occupant density exceeded 100 people per thousand square feet. So this was really limited to spaces like auditoriums, arenas, lecture halls, and casinos. But starting with the 2007 version, this threshold was lowered to any space with more than 40 people per thousand square feet. This slide shows the impact of that change. On the left are the space types for which the default occupant density is greater than 100 people per thousand square feet. And the list on the right includes those spaces with greater than 40 people per thousand square feet. So you can, you can see that this change requires demand control ventilation in more types of spaces, shown in red here. This includes dining rooms and cafeterias, conference rooms, courtrooms, and dance floors. Then in the 2013 version, the standard 90.1 committee lowered this threshold even further. It now requires DCV in any space with as few as 25 people per thousand square feet. The biggest impact of this change is probably in school buildings, since this lower threshold now includes classrooms, computer labs, and media centers. And it also affects reception areas, galleries, and health clubs. So any zone meeting this criteria for occupant density must use demand control ventilation if the system includes an airside economizer or other type of modulating outdoor damper or if the system's design outdoor airflow exceeds 3,000 CFM. Now while 3,000 CFM is a pretty high threshold for what we're calling small rooftop systems, most rooftops are likely to be equipped with an economizer, so would then be subject to this requirement. 
Like other requirements in the standard, there are several exceptions. So just a few comments related to small rooftops. First, if the system's design outdoor airflow is less than 750 CFM, then it's exempt from this requirement. Many small rooftop systems, especially those smaller than 10 tons, may qualify for this exception. And then exception four is related to spaces that need makeup air. For example, this applies to a restaurant or cafeteria where the outdoor air is delivered to the dining area and is needed to replace air that is being exhausted out of the kitchen. In that case, DCV would not be required. Airside economizing and demand controlled ventilation can be applied to either single zone or multiple zone systems. While fan pressure optimization, which John mentioned earlier, applies to only multiple zone VEV systems. There's also the case for supplier temperature reset and ventilation optimization. Remember that supplier temperature reset involves raising the temperature of the air delivered by the central rooftop unit from 55 to 60 or 65 degrees, for example, during part load operation in an effort to reduce overall system energy use. And ventilation optimization involves reducing the amount of outer air brought in through the central rooftop unit in response to changes in system ventilation efficiency as both the zone level VAV dampers and supply fan speed modulate. We've discussed all three of these strategies in previous ENL programs, but as small rooftop units are being applied more and more into multiple zone VEV systems, these strategies are becoming more common, particularly since all three are now required by ASHRAE standard 90.1. The final trend we've seen with respect to small rooftop system controls is an increased interest in building automation. Traditionally, in a building that used small rooftop equipment, each rooftop had its own thermostat, but there typically wasn't any sort of supervisory control. But technology advances like wireless communications, connectivity, and the prevalence of smartphones and tablets has led to a greater demand for automation. Automation systems for small buildings help coordinate scheduling, optimize system control, and aid in troubleshooting problems. Another driver for this trend is a new set of requirements that Standard 90.1 added to its 2013 version. This new section defines when a system or piece of equipment must be equipped with direct digital controls. Here's an excerpt from table in that standard, which relates to small rooftop systems. First, for a new system, the VAV terminals and rooftop unit must be equipped with DDC if the rooftop serves more than three zones and the fan system is at least 10 brake horsepower. These same criteria apply even when renovating an existing system and installing a new rooftop unit, as long as 75% of the zone terminals are also new. And even if you're adding or replacing a single VAV terminal, it must be equipped with a DDC controller if the other zones served by that same rooftop unit already have DDC. This new section also defines specific capabilities of the DDC system, such as graphical display of input and output points, as well as trend data. So we're also seeing an increased use of graphical displays for controlling small rooftops. Here's an example of a display that allows the operator to visually inspect and adjust unit operation, including trend data. So there have been a lot of changes in the world of small rooftops, efficiency regulations, variable speed compressors and fans, modulating heat, control technology, and so on. John, you said earlier that one of the advantages of small rooftop systems is that they're simple to design, install, and start up. How is that impacted by these recent trends? I don't think higher efficiencies, variable speed compressors, or modulating heat add more complication to those tasks, but do probably require service personnel to be more knowledgeable. But single zone VAV and multiple zone VAV units certainly require more expertise at startup. So make sure the installer is up to date on both the equipment and the setup of the controls. Thanks. As a sort of summary, Eric, how do we quantify the impact of these trends on energy use? That's hard to do without performing an energy analysis. 
So we modeled a single story office building just under 30,000 square feet in three locations, Boston, Massachusetts, St. Louis, Missouri, and Atlanta, Georgia. We started with a traditional constant volume single zone system with gas heat. This is a standard constant volume rooftop with minimum efficiencies dictated by standard 90.1. Next, we compared against a traditional single zone VAV system, dry bulb or enthalpy controlled economizers where required, and staged heat. Finally, we compared against a better performing single zone VAV system. This system includes comparative enthalpy economizers, variable speed scroll compressors, variable speed condenser fans, and modulating gas heat. So here's the layout of the building. This building could be zoned in a couple of different ways, and this is how we did it. The perimeter spaces were set up with their own rooftops. Next, the large interior open office was set up with its own. The four conference rooms are served by one rooftop, then the restrooms and the break room. And finally, the hallway has its own rooftop. That came out to 10 different units. Based upon the climate, some rooftops will require economizer control per 90.1. Where required, economizers were modeled with enthalpy control in Atlanta and St. Louis and dry bulb control in Boston. For this analysis, we looked at HVAC energy use. The three alternatives per city are shown in the horizontal axis with energy use expressed as a percentage of the traditional single zone constant volume system on the vertical axis. The blue bars represent the cooling and heat rejection energy while the gray bars show fan energy and the red bars show heating energy. In all three climates, the cooling and heat rejection energy increased when single zone VAV is applied compared to the constant volume system. Remember that single zone VAV doesn't cycle the compressors on and off at part load. Instead, the supply air volume is reduced. The addition of variable speed scroll compressors and condenser fans also reduce the energy usage for the cooling system in each climate. The fan energy savings are clearly shown in each climate. When single zone VAV is applied, supply fan energy is dramatically decreased. Finally, the addition of modulating gas heat further reduces fan energy during winter operation for the colder climate in Boston. So when compared against a traditional single zone constant volume system, a high-performing single-zone VV system with variable speed compressors, modulating gas heat, and variable speed supply fans reduces HVC energy consumption significantly. In this analysis, about 34%. Thanks, guys. We hope you enjoyed the CNL program and that you found it a helpful way to learn about some of the recent regulatory and technology trends related to small rooftop systems. As always, the bibliography included in your handout provides more information on where to find a number of resources related to today's topics. Or contact your local train account manager for specific information on train's rooftop products. For those of you seeking continuing education credit, be sure to check out our continuing education programs, which include many past ENLs, all free and on demand. And please remember to fill out a survey and let us know what you think of today's program. AIA members, turn in your member information to your local site coordinator. And finally, please ask your local host about details for the remaining Engineers Newsletter Live programs for this year. In the next DNL, we'll be discussing HVAC myths and realities. And in fall, we'll be discussing high performance air systems and demand response in commercial buildings. So please plan to join us. Thanks for your time today, and we look forward to seeing you next time.